Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Latola, and I'd like to welcome you to this clinical presentation from Glidewell Laboratories. Today I want to talk about something that's been causing a lot of confusion uh, amongst a lot of dentists, and that is how we are going to bond in some of our new high-strength all-ceramic restorations. And so mainly we're going to talk about Bruxer, but we're also going to talk about Emax as well, because both of these monolithic materials fall under the heading of a high-strength, cementable, uh, all-ceramic material. And they're both kind of the same in the way we deal with them, but the Bruxer is kind of a specific case. So before we get to that, let's think for a minute about how we've been treating all-ceramic restorations you know, for the last 15 to 20 years. It's been pretty simple, whether we had feldspathic porcelain veneers or crowns, or if we had a lucite reinforced uh, porcelain such as empress. When it came time to put these restorations in the mouth, they had already been etched with hydrofluoric acid at the laboratory, and so it was a matter of trying them in with or without try-in paste. And we would try them in the mouth and we'd verify the marginal fit and the aesthetics look good. And usually we'd be using a water-soluble try-in paste. So when it came time to clean it out, we could just take our air water syringe uh, and clean everything out of the inside of the veneer. Uh, some dentists would use a phosphoric acid, an intraoral 37% phosphoric acid gel uh, to clean the inside of the veneer out as well, and that would work too. It wasn't really strong enough to remove any of the glassy matrix like the hydrofluoric acid was, but it certainly could do a good job of helping to remove some of the contaminants that were on the inside of the restoration. So for many years, cleaning it out with water, uh, cleaning it out with phosphoric acid was a good approach to these all ceramic restorations to get them ready to be uh, bonded into place afterwards. Uh, today, things have changed though with some of the materials that we have. Um, Emax, for example, can be cleaned with phosphoric acid and it actually works fine. You can still, it's actually etched with hydrofluoric acid uh, in, the, in your laboratory just like the old restorations used to be. So when you look at the inside of an Emax restoration, you'll see that kind of frosty etched look that we're used to seeing on the internal surface of an all ceramic restoration. So after you try an Emax crown into place, for example, uh, you can rinse it out with uh, water afterwards and an air spray, and you can also use uh, phosphoric acid on it. If you have hydrofluoric acid etch in your office, you can use that as well. In fact, the one time you definitely want to use hydrofluoric acid on Emax is if you've tried it in with some sort of silicone. So if you used uh, something like Fit Checker, where you mix up a silicone, put it on the inside of the crown, and try it on the tooth to verify the fit, that's going to be a time where you'd rather use the hydrofluoric acid rather than the phosphoric acid when cleaning out the crown and getting ready to cement it uh, at that point. So that's really kind of the one thing about Emax. Otherwise, Emax uh, acts a lot like uh, the regular all ceramic materials of the past did, where we're now going to paint a silane material like Monobond Plus from Ivaclar on the inside of the crown and then cement or bond that crown into place. So that's pretty simple and straightforward with the one thing being if you use a silicone fit checker uh, to try the crown into place, you're gonna want to uh, get that out of the inside of the crown with hydrofluoric acid rather than phosphoric acid. Things change, however, uh, when we get to Bruxer because it's zirconia oxide. And actually, everything that I'm gonna say that applies to Bruxer because it's zirconia oxide also applies to the other zirconia oxide-based crowns as well, whether it's lava from 3MSB, Procera zirconia, uh, Sircon, or any of the many other zirconia-based restorations out there. This applies to all of them, uh, not just to Bruxer. And so there's something different that goes on with zirconia oxide. So when you get a Bruxer crown or a zirconia-based crown back from the laboratory and you try it into the mouth, it's almost impossible to try it into the mouth without getting some saliva on the internal surface of the crown. And as it turns out, the only thing that really reacts with zirconia oxide are phosphate groups. And so when you try a crown into the mouth and you get saliva on the inside and then you take it out and you rinse out the Bruxer crown with a water and air syringe, it looks like you got all the saliva out of there. But what happens is the phosphate groups that are in saliva, which is full of phospholipids and some other forms, those phosphate groups remain bound to the zirconia oxide on the inside of the crown. So you've rinsed all the saliva out to the best of your knowledge, but what you can't see is that you've actually got phosphate particles still bonded to the zirconia particles. And as a result, all the bonding sites are now taken up. 
And so regardless of what you do at this point, you're not going to get a good bond uh, between the cement or between the silane or anything and the zirconia crown because of the contamination of the saliva and these phosphate groups. So you might ask yourself, how am I going to be able to clean this out? Well, there was a study done in 2008 and was published in the Journal of uh, Dental Materials. And, and let's take a look at what they did. They actually took zirconia-based crowns and they treated them in four different ways. Uh, they bonded a crown that had not been tried into the mouth yet. And they took another crown and tried it into the mouth. And then they rinsed it with water for 15 seconds and then air dried it. And then they took a second crown and they immersed it in 70% isopropyl alcohol uh, for two minutes and then rinsed and dried that. They took a third crown and they etched it twice with 37% uh, phosphoric acid two different times and then rinse and dried that and then the fourth crown they took and they simply sandblasted it with 50 micron aluminum oxide for 15 seconds and as you can see on the graph um, the non-contaminated crown got a really good bond strength almost 40 megapascals of, of bond strength between the cement and the zirconia crown itself you can see the water is zero it would not bond at all so the crown that was tried into the mouth, the zirconia crown that was tried in the mouth and simply rinsed out with water had zero bond between the resin in the cement and the zirconia oxide in the crown. You can see the isopropyl alcohol also had zero bond strength between the two. Phosphoric acid improved it just a little bit if you cleaned out the inside of the zirconia crown with phosphoric acid. And what actually worked the best was sandblasting the inside of it that helped blow some of the phosphate groups off there, but it still didn't get it back up to the point of where it would be if it was non-contaminated. So what actually happens when the phosphate groups in the saliva come in contact with the zirconia oxide in the brux or crown? Well, it's an acid-base reaction that takes place. And if you remember back to your high school chemistry, when you have uh, an acid-base reaction and the two come together, you get formation of a salt and a water. So as you see here on the screen, uh, when the phosphate groups over on the left react with the zirconium oxide, the salt we get is zirconium phosphate and then we lose some water in that reaction as well. And so now all the, the binding sites are now taken up by these phosphate groups on the zirconia. As it turns out, we're going to use these bonding sites to our advantage, but we've got to get rid of the salivary phosphate groups that are still in place. So how do we get rid of these phosphate groups that are bound to the zirconium oxide on the inside of the brux or crown? Well, not every dentist, in fact, most dentists don't have uh, a 50 micron aluminum oxide uh, sandblaster in their office that they can use all the time. And there's a, fortunately an easier way to do it, and it's a, a product from Ivoclar called IvoClean. And this solution, when placed on the inside of the crown, will actually remove those phosphate groups from the zirconia oxide particles in the brux or crown and then when rinsed away, we're gonna have fresh binding sites. So how does it work? It's actually zirconium oxide, about 10 to 15% by weight in an aqueous solution. And so there's a chemical reaction that takes place. We're gonna flood the inside of the contaminated Bruxer crown with zirconium oxide. And because of the concentration gradient, we've got so much zirconium oxide free in the IvoClean that it actually acts like a sponge and it attracts and absorbs the phosphate groups from the inside of the brux or crown and those phosphate groups become attached, become bound to the zirconium oxide particles in the IvoClean. Then after 20 seconds, it's simply a matter of washing the IvoClean out of the crown and now we have some fresh zirconia oxide bonding sites on the inside of the brux or crown that we can take advantage of. So as you see, the IvoClean is again 10 to 15% zirconia oxide particles by weight. And what I want you to notice when you see these numbers on the screen is that the pH is 13 to 13 and a half. So this is a very alkaline material, which means that it's very corrosive. Uh, so you need to be careful. You do not want to use IvoClean intraorally. You do not want to get it in or around your eyes. I mean, you're wearing gloves while you're using it as well. Um, so you're going to place it inside uh, of the Bruxer crown or the zirconia-based crown, leaving it for 20 seconds and rinse it out uh, over a sink. But you do not want to be using IvoClean intraorally because of how alkaline it is. There's even a more recent study that was done by Ivoclar looking at the same salivary contamination of zirconia oxide. And if you look at the screen, you'll see that um, they did the same thing. They took a non-contaminated crown and bonded to it and got over 45 megapascals of uh, bond strength. 
And then they tried a zirconia based crown into the mouth and then they rinsed it out with water and attempted to bond to that and that was about 15 megapascals. And you can see in this study, the phosphoric acid actually made it worse. And that kind of makes sense. If you think about the fact that we have a contaminated Bruxer crown that's been tried in the mouth and so phosphate groups from the saliva have now bound themselves to the zirconia oxide on the inside of the Bruxer crown. If we take phosphoric acid, which is full of phosphate groups, and put that on the inside of the crown, we're going to take up even more bonding sites trying to do the right thing with the phosphoric acid. And that was, as you can see, the lowest bond strength that they got in this study. And then when they used the IvoClean on the crown that had been tried into the mouth, uh, you can see the bond strength is right at 45 megapascals. And so it does a really good job of getting rid of those phosphate groups and giving us a fresh site uh, to bond to. So here's the bottom line after all that scientific justification for what I'm about to tell you. Anytime you try a Bruxer crown into the mouth or a lava crown, any zirconia based crown into the mouth and it comes in contact with saliva, which is about 100% of the time, there's going to be salivary contamination of the inside of that crown that has to be dealt with or there's a possibility that crown will debond and fall off one time, two times, three times. It could just continue to go on and on. So when a Bruxer crown or a zirconia based crown has been tried in the mouth and then it's taken out, the IvaClean needs to be used to freshen up the surface of the crown on the inside so we can now get something to stick to it. What are we going to get to stick to it? Well, you could use something on the inside like Monobond Plus, a Silane from IvaClar, Vivident. You could use Z Prime Plus from Bisco. Both of these products have phosphate groups in them and that's how they're able to bond to the Bruxer or the Lava Crown. You could also use a new cement that I've been using recently called Ceramer uh, from a company called Doxa. It's a cement that actually has phosphates in the cement itself so you don't need to use a silane. It bonds directly to the Bruxer Crown itself. So anytime a Bruxer crown goes in the mouth, which again is about 100% of the time, very few dentists will just cement a crown out without trying it in first. Anytime a Bruxer or a lava crown is tried in the mouth, it needs to be cleaned with the IvaClean, 20 seconds, then it gets rinsed out. Then you're either gonna place a silane, such as the Monobond Plus or the Z Prime Plus, and then evaporate that, and then go through the regular cementation or bonding steps that you would do. Or after you rinse out the IvaClean, you can go directly to the Ceramer cement, which has the phosphate groups in the cement and will therefore bond to the Bruxer crown itself. Now, the reason why dentists often ask, well, why might a crown like a Bruxer crown come off more or seem to come off more uh, than an other zirconia based crown like a lava crown? And that's a great question. And the reason why is because of Bruxer's strength as a monolithic material, we're able to use it as a cast gold replacement material. And so a lot of the restorations that we get from dentists are on lower second molars, areas where we can't get a lot of reduction. And by definition, we have a very short clinical crown, a very non-retentive situation. So when you mix that non-retentive crown prep with the fact that the Bruxer crown got tried in and contaminated and now nothing's sticking to it, that has a tendency to fall off more. A lava crown, on the other hand, needs a millimeter and a half to two millimeters of reduction so you never use a lava crown on a lower second molar, for example, probably not even a lower first molar, although if you did, you would probably have a prep that was about four millimeters tall, and so mechanical retention would not be a big deal. It's because of the fact that Brux are so strong, and we can use it in so many demanding clinical situations where we have short clinical crowns, that there's more of a tendency for those crowns to come off. It's the same zirconia. It's got nothing to do with that, and then everything to do with the prep design underneath those crowns. So regardless of what zirconia based material you're using, once it gets tried in the mouth, it needs to have the IvaClean on the inside of it for 20 seconds, then it's rinsed out. Then you can either go with the phosphate containing Ceramer cement, or you can take that same crown and instead use the Z Prime Plus or the Monobond Plus and then cement or bond with your cement of choice. I realize this is a, a whole new field, uh, a whole new material that we're dealing with in some different clinical situations. So uh, I'm glad you took the time to watch this and, and understand it. And once you understand these principles, you're going to find that you do not have these restorations coming off anymore. So on behalf of myself and everybody here at the laboratory, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry.